Okay, good morning. Let's get started. Welcome to the joint CS NETSYS seminar. This is the last seminar in this series for the year. Before introducing our speaker, I have an announcement to make. Following this seminar, there will be an event that will take place in the um, uh, in this area, in the uh, uh, atrium. Uh, there will be a distinguished lecture by the Nobel laureate Alvin Roth on matching and market design at 1.30. Between 11 and 1.30, there will be book signing and a lunch reception in the atrium. If you would like to attend the distinguished lecture, you are welcome to stay and attend the lunch. And now let me introduce our speaker today. She is Professor Yasemin Mostafi from UC Santa Barbara Electrical and Computer Engineering Department. She received her PhD from Stanford University, and her research is at the intersection of the areas of robotics and communications. She is the recipient of many awards, including the Career Award, the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers, and Ruberti Prize from the IEEE Control Society. Her research has appeared in many news menus, including BBC, Huffington Post, IEEE Spectrum, and others. Let's give her a warm welcome. Hey, thank you very much, Andrew, for the invitation and for that nice introduction. Hi, everybody. Um, it's great to be here today. So as Andrew mentioned, my research lab works at the intersection of communication and robotics. And today, I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the possibilities and challenges at this intersection. So as we all know, the idea of unmanned vehicles being part of our society and help us achieve tasks is not that futuristic anymore. Um, a lot of us are waiting for Amazon to drop our mails with uh, Prime Air, and we're hoping to drive in a self-driving uh, car pretty soon. On the communication side also, um, radio frequency signals are everywhere these days. We want more and more connectivity, and as a result of that, we're bombarded by these signals. In fact, um, prediction by Eris, Ericsson and Cisco, um, it predicts that by 2020, there's going to be around 50 billion connected devices out there. So what are all the possibilities at this intersection? In the first part of the talk, I'm going to talk about how radio frequency signals can be used to give new forms of sensing to unmanned vehicles and in general new forms of sensing for learning about the environment. Then in the second part of the talk, I'm going to talk about um, using radio frequency signal for communication as we typically do and how to enable robust connectivity of a team of unmanned vehicles. So in that part, we're going to talk about more how to bring in issues from robotics and path hunting um, together with communication-related issues and properly co-optimize them under resource constraint. Let's start with the first part of the talk. Um, so let's start, let's consider this problem. Let's say I have these two unmanned vehicles this is outside of our building at UC Santa Barbara. They come uh, out of this area, this, this brick area. They've never been here. They have um, Wi-Fi transceivers on board. One of them is transmitting a signal, the other one is receiving it. And they're interested in imaging this area through walls. So this brick area through walls. So, and they only have their Wi-Fi transmissions, and they can only measure the things that are very easy to measure, like an RSSI signal, like a signal power. Right? So very basic. So let's consider this problem more closely. As these wireless transmissions go through the objects in the area, each object attenuates the signal um, according to its material property, right? And so we can think of the information of the each object is implicit in the received signal. However, these informations of all these objects is pretty mixed up uh, to the level that it's very hard to reverse this and get 
um, the information of the objects from the received signal. So it's a very hard problem in general. In fact, if you look at the um, electromagnetics literature um, and um, the topic of like um, imaging or um, sensing with, in general, radio frequency signals, um, typically you see a lot of uh, bulky hardware, specialized hardware used, a um, lot of resources, a lot of large bandwidth to be able to do any sensing along these lines. And typically, the results are very limiting. But here, um, so we're interested in using pretty much what it comes on the with um, the um, on the on board with these unmanned vehicles. And but then the and, and we're interested in imaging all the details through these um, thick concrete, uh, thick in this case brick walls that are highly attenuated. Um, but the advantage we have is that we have unmanned vehicles. So we could have a lot of antenna positioning and optimize for them. And ask ourselves, what are some of the motion patterns? Or in other words, what are some of the antenna positioning that could uh, basically allow us to uh, image through these walls and reveal what is inside? So that's what we're going to look at. And that's a problem that has been of interest to my research lab for many years now. So let's take a little closer look at this problem. So I'm going to talk about a couple of the ingredients that allowed us to do this kind of imaging through walls. So now look at the electric field uh, in this transmission from this uh, first drone to the second uh, drone. Um, this is the volume integral equation. It basically um, it expresses the um, electric field as a function of the objects, this O tilde, the objects in the area. Um, so this O tilde is basically a function of the uh, permittivity and permeability, uh, electric and magnetic properties of the objects. But if, I, if you closely examine the volume integral equation, um, because you have this electric field term here, basically this becomes a very nonlinear function of all the objects. And typically, we don't want to start with a you know, um, nonlinear expression as our starting point. So we use a lot of different kind of uh, linearizing approximations. Um, you can use um, Rital wave approximation or WKB approximations um, from wave literature, um, which are different kinds of approximations. But what they allow you to do is basically express your received power measurements at different points. And these are the points as the drones move around as a function of this O vector, which is basically you can call it object information. It's a function of the permeability and um, permittivity um, of the objects, uh, in, uh, basically in 3D at different voxels. And this matrix here basically is, it becomes a nicely function of the routes you design for these unmanned vehicles. So, um, to linearize the approximations, you can basically, as our starting point, um, have this um, linear expression relating your received power measurements as a drone moves to the object information. Now, just to give you some intuitions, for instance, the WKB uh, model is really um, a very, um, that has a nice intuition. So, uh, consider, for instance, the line from transmitter to the receiver. And then for every object that it goes through in the dB domain, you're going to consider a, um, a particular, uh, uh, there will be an attenuation. And they're going to be all linear, sum, summed up as you go through different objects. And that is basically your um, linear model. Okay. So, and then the retail model is more, uh, more extensive and um, more um, basically um, comprehensive considering um, not just the objects on the main route, but um, other objects as well. Okay, so now let's take a look at the path planning. So as my drone is moving, it's as if I have basically several antenna position. And I want to optimize them, come up with what are the best routes to use for this problem to make this area most visible. So over the years, we've looked at um, many different kinds of routes just to bring an understanding of their impact on this imaging through wall problem. So the one that um, we've looked at very extensively are uh, the, the routes that are, are, are shown here on the left side, which I call semi-parallel routes. So basically, the transmitter and receiver would choose an angle. In this case, let's say zero degree. 
And they um, fly basically um, on that route while one transmits, the other one receives. Now, in principle, basically, they don't have to be exactly going on these parallel routes as long as the line from one to the other stays orthogonal to this angle, then that satisfies a route condition. In, in other words, they don't have to exactly maintain the same distance the whole time. The distance between them can change, but as long as the line from one to the other stays orthogonal to this um, zero degree angle, then that, that, that's why we call it semi parallel routes. Then you can choose a different angle, 45 degrees, go on that the same manner, one transfer, one receives, and so on. But depending on the environment and the constraints in the environment, they may not be able to do these kind of routes. So we have looked a lot at other routes. So one of them maybe would um, loiter for a bit, and the other one maybe um, go around the area. And then this one changes position, they keep doing that. Or maybe they have other tasks to do. Really, they can't just optimize for um, um, the imaging through wall. So they're going on whatever route they're going, and then do transmission reception as much as possible um, along those routes. So let's, uh, let me tell you a little bit about some of the properties, particularly of these left um, um, routes. So there are a lot of nice properties about these routes. For instance, if you consider, um, here I'm showing it in two, two, like these 2D slides, um, and they got this uh, uh, basically um, angle theta, and one transmits, the other receives, and this is the received power measurement at angle theta, the function of time, this white curve. If you take a one d Fourier transform of it, the Fourier slice theorem tells us that basically this is the sample of the 2D Fourier of this area at that particular angle. So basically, by uh, making this kind of measurements, I am basically measuring the samples of the 2D Fourier transform of this area at that angle. Now, for those of you that have worked with compressive sensing, um, basically, as you recall, having basically um, samples in Fourier domain and trying to take advantage of sparsity of an area in the space domain, that actually allows us to post things nice and compressive sensing framework. And when we look at a lot of areas, we have sparsity in the space domain. I'm gonna come back to it and say a little bit about how we take advantage of it in solving this problem. So that's one um, nice property of um, these routes. Um, what are some of the other properties? So also you can prove um, other things for uh, simplified situations. For instance, if you consider the, uh, this um, a wall at a particular um, angle, in this case at zero degrees, so this, this white um, area here, parallel routes at 90 minus that angle, 90 minus theta, so in this case in 90 degrees, so if these um, two drones fly at this um, 90 degrees in this picture, you can, you can prove that it maximizes entropy reduction. So basically they're, the, they're gonna be the most informative. So basically, um, we looked at these kind of uh, analysis over the years and we came up with, um, Kind of strategies for what should be the uh, what are some of the characteristics of the best routes these um, robots can take, which basically means best antenna positioning. And so, the robot routes should include, in general, angles that maximizes spatial changes, because basically you want to capture the most spatial changes as possible. But also, there are really interesting trade-offs between diversity and performance, meaning that if you give me um, very little um, uh, sample measurements to take, wireless sample measurements to take, maybe I don't want to put all of them at just one angle because I will lose perspective of this area from other angles. So I may want to also spread them to other angles as well so, so to have that diversity perspective. 
And then there's also your energy efficiency because these uh, unmanned vehicles, let's say you're using drones, you know, they may have like seven minutes of flight time and a very limited flight time. Um, so you also want to take that into account. Um, and so putting all these, to, these things together, um, we've come up with a set of routes to be used. And I'm going to show you in the real experiments, um, there's some sample experiments that we use. Another interesting thing you can do is you can adapt during the process. So the unmanned vehicles, as, as they're going around the area, they can image and then they can see based on the image quality words from the areas that need more um, sampling. So um, let, me sh uh, let me now talk about, um, show you some of the sample routes. So um, in the results, I'm going to, in the experiment results, I'm going to show you in a bit. Um, these are, for instance, some of the sample routes the unmanned vehicles are going to use. Um, they're going to, for instance, here, they're going at 0 degree and 45 degrees, but they're going to take it in multiple planes. The um, um, z equals to, let's say, 0, so the two horizontal planes and two sloped planes, basically. And basically, they're doing, they're repeating these angles at basically four different planes here. And these um, basically, is based on trying to strike a balance between the limited energy they have, trying to capture um, the spatial changes uh, as much as possible dictated by the theory and, and the diversity. At the end, it's not, um, it's not like we can find optimum optimum for theoretically for all, like for a general setup, but based on finding the optimum theoretically for simple setup, basically we have a um, a basically a uh, recipe or prescription for what's, what's the best uh, um, way of path planning um, for this. Excellent, excellent question. So um, they will, so um, in, in our experiments, so basically they, what they do is um, they have waypoints that they need to go to and basically when they get there, they're trying to see if the other person if the other drone is there or not, and they'll wait for each other. So they have a Tango tablet on board based on which they're going to localize themselves and then to control their motion. There's going to be error, um, certainly a couple of centimeters based on our measurements on X, Y, Z. Most of it is in the Z direction. Um, and so there will be, nevertheless, the best we do, there will be errors. Um, so we did a lot of analysis of the impact of that on the imaging. Um, so I have a lot of results. I don't have it here, but I have it in the paper. But um, so it will impact it. But um, the the most dominant performance degradation factor is the modeling of the wave. And at the moment, we're bottlenecked by that. The errors that we're experiencing in the uh, positioning being off and the alignment being off is not. Um, yet enough as compared to that. The more we get our modeling better and we can do better, then we're going to see the impact of those more. That's a very good question. So, um, okay, so a last piece um, let's see, to talk about. So we talked about the modeling impact, the path planning part. So even if you do your best path planning and you do your, um, you know, you have, you have that linearized model, this problem is still very underdetermined. So we have a linear approximation that we came up with. The number of unknowns, it's a lot more than the number of measurements you take. So uh, typically, the number of measurements is less than 5%. As compared to number of unknowns, number of unknowns will be the number of voxels, let's say, in a 3D area that you need to, um, you need to um, image, number of measurements being the number of wires measurements you took. So it's, uh, extremely underdetermined. And so there, if you don't do anything, there's going to be a lot of ambiguity about the solution. So what we do is we take advantage of the inherent sparsity of a lot of spaces. So we look at a lot of spaces, you know, so here um, there's, there's, a, uh, there's a floor here for a while. Spatial changes uh, there's, is zero for a while. And it jumps and then it jumps to the chairs. So a uh, lot of spaces have that um, the spatial variations are small in a lot of spaces. So um, we take advantage of that, and I discussed that in the, earlier in the context of um, uh, compressive sensing, having samples in the frequency domain and taking advantage of sparsity in space domain. Other things we take advantage of is, uh, um, so one, another thing is spatial dependency. 
So let's say um, you look at the 3D space, look at a voxel. If that voxel decision is that, oh, there's an object here, but it looks around, voxels around it, and everybody around it votes that there's no object at their location, well, that's kind of unusual. There's typically a little bit more spatial correlation in typical spaces. So what we do is we model this, the, uh, the 3D space as a Markov random field and basically um, do belief propagation um, over it where every voxel talks to its neighbors, look at its decisions, the decisions of the neighbors, and update its um, decision also accordingly. Okay? So especially going to 3D, um, this is very important. In 2D, um, we could do 2D imaging with, without this, but 3D going to 3D, it's very hard to extract information in 3D. So let me summarize the key ingredients that we discussed. So we talked about the model and how we come up with an approximated wave model. Talked about the big part path planning how it would allow me to have several uh, autonomous receiver and transceiver antenna positions. And I talked about how we take advantage of the sparsity and underlying compressibility of the information to get around the um, ambiguity of the solution. So let me show you some of the results. I'm gonna show you some of the results starting with 3D results. So this, this is the area I showed you earlier. So this is what is inside there that the drones wanted to image. So we have the two drones, um, they come to each other. The keys, they've never been here, they've never made measurements here. Uh, this is the area of interest from top. This is the 3D binary ground truth image of it. And that is how they basically imaged it, um, just based on Wi-Fi transmission. So now, we don't expect at all perfect transmission, a uh, perfect um, reconstruction, but it is, is quite informative um, given how hard this problem is and how much attenuation goes through that goes through the wall. And the fact that we're only measuring the, this is just RSSI measurement that you can easily read. We don't not use any phased information any, uh, or any large band or specialized uh, expensive equipment. So let me show you some of our earlier results. Um, and they were in 2D with ground vehicles. Um, so, so this is the area of interest. The basic, as they take routes, you can see how basically the uh, color image is actually a material property. Although at this point, we're not that interested in material property more in is there an object there or not. So as they take different routes, you can see how um, the image improved. Here we're not running the mark of random field, so you can see it's a little bit lumpier, less clean as compared to the um, 3D case that I showed you. Um, these are some of our um, earlier results from some of the years back. Um, so this was the 2D cut of the area, and this is basically how they um, imaged the area. This is the most painful part of our job. <laughs> Basically, we have the space out of our building to build the, our own structures, and we put ads for undergrads to come, and we pay them, but they're too rich, I think. They just don't want to come do the job. So here we put two objects inside. Um, if I go back there and you see that um, they were imaged correctly, but one of the walls was um, actually lumped together as an object. This is my, um, used to be my main PhD student on this uh, project. He goes in and he gets, uh, he gets imaged and localized. Uh, and again, a lot of these uh, measurements and dimensions, they match the true one um, pretty well. So, uh, so, so this started for us, this imaging true wall, I got interested in it many years ago, and so we've been um, improving it and going throughout the years. But then, uh, some years, five, six years back, um, I was wondering, well, so, okay, so we can image through walls, a lot of information in these RF signals. What else can they tell us about the environment? Can I just use the existing RF signals, Wi-Fi signals to um, maybe count the number of people here? Learn other things about the environment? So that got us started along that route. So now, not just talking about un uh, unmanned vehicles, but in general, what else can we learn? For instance, uh, crowd counting in an area can Wi-Fi links count the number of people in an area? In an office environment, can they figure out a distribution, spatial distribution of the people so we can optimize heating and cooling? 
in a grocery store, can they figure out um, the um, arrival rate or speed of people in different aisles or how people go from flow from an aisle to another to figure out the popularity of different products, to be basically better optimize, the store can be better optimize uh, their resource planning. And in a smart home, can it figure out um, your Sonos nodes or smart speakers or everything is now, uh, have typically have some form of uh, communication capability. Can they figure out that it was you that entered the house? Maybe um, now uh, basically um, set the music, set the light and everything to your uh, uh, desirable setting. So let me show you some of the things we have done along these lines. Let's consider this problem of crowd counting. In this particular case, I'm showing you even crowd counting through walls. So I have a Wi-Fi transmitter behind this wall, Wi-Fi receiver behind the side of the wall. This is a classroom at UCSB. You see a lot of people walking here. They go walking casually, they make crisscross, you know, you can do whatever, you know, casual walk would do. Without relying on their personal devices, based on just transmissions from this uh, Wi-Fi transmitter, measuring the received powers on this Wi-Fi receiver, can we count how many people are in this area? It turns out that the received signal power has a lot of information on the total number of people. So that's what we want to understand is that how sensitive is the received signal power to the total number of people? How do we mathematically characterize it and then estimate the number of people? So I'm going to briefly tell you a little bit about um, some of the steps we took along this line and then I'll show you some results. This is a sample of RSSI measurement as people walked in this area. And so we can, uh, in a high level, think of people impacted that link in two ways. They block the link as they uh, are walking. They will be uh, block the line of sight. There will be a big drop in the received signal. So that's one way. But also, if they're not even blocking the link, it could be a um, reflection off of them, contributing to multi-part effect and rapid changes of the signal. So our mathematical framework uh, tries to basically bring these uh, factors and relate them to the number of people. Most people, there are two things we look at. This is the received signal power. So what we've shown is that uh, the variations of the received signal power itself, the, the amplitude, um, carries a lot of information of number of people. But also, another important factor that we've discovered is the inter-event times. If I define events as the instance of significant signal drop, the time between those events, it turns out, carries a lot of useful information about the number of people in the area. And you can imagine if there are a lot of more people, this time is going to become smaller, there are going to be more instances, faster instances of significant um, drops. And so what we've done is we've characterized these things probabilistically and relate them to the mathematically to the total number of people in the area. Basically, we're trying to model that link as a sensor for the number of people. And what is that sensor model? So that's what we're doing. So <coughs> just to show you, um, so I'm not going into details of the proofs, but you can prove that the PDF of the signal magnitude basically has this expression as a function of total number of people in the area. And you can show through analyzing this is that it is sensitive to the total number of people in the area. As you change the total number of people in the area, they, it will show its impact in the PDF. Now the inter-event times here, this is for discretizing the time, so it's the PMF of inter-event times. You can also prove that that PMF is function of this capital and the total number of people in the area in this manner. And the interesting thing about inter-event times, and the reason we started exploring that, is that when you go through walls, if you want to do crowd counting through walls, there's going to be a lot of attenuations. The inter-event times are going to be a little bit more robust to those attenuations as compared to if I just directly do use the first um, theorem. So our initial result was we used the, uh, the first theorem where people were walking in the same uh, area, so it wasn't true walls. And then when we went to true wall crowd counting, then uh, we extended it to inter -event. So let me show you some of the results. I want to just show you um, the true wall results 
um, for the sake of time. So again, so here um, you can see the people walking in different areas. This is the number of people and this is how it was counted. These are independent experiments that I'm just showing next to each other. So meaning that there was a case of seven people walked independently and then nine people walked. It's not like people just kind of keep increasing. This is another um, area. Um, so we're going to different areas with different materials. For instance, here these are um, walls or a mixture of concrete and plaster. So highly attenuating. 20 people were walking. It was estimated as um, 19. The key thing about all this is that, go ahead. So, good question. So, basically, events here are uh, um, defined as uh, basically instance of significant signal drop. So, and then inter event time would be the time between such events. And so you could imagine if there are a lot of people walking, there are going to be a well, higher chance of uh, signal drops more often, and the timing between them becomes smaller. So that timing, the time between them and its distribution, in principle, should carry some information about the number of people. And that's what we're doing in order to reverse it and count. So going back to these results, so basically, uh, thinking about these things is that so this is without relying on people to carry it, all the, uh, any device, all these results. It's more about how people's movements affect the link. Also, another key thing is that we didn't do even any calibration in the area of interest, meaning there was no prior even measurements was made in this room when there was, let's say, nobody around. So, so that's this, uh, because um, when you, we look at uh, um, other attempts to, um, to count the number of people, um, typically there's some form of uh, machine learning in the sense that let's have three people walk here and make a lot of measurements and have five people here walk, make a lot of measurements and nine people and then well, the real experiment they were trying to reverse and see which one was matched best. Here we're not doing any of those and this is basically based on understanding theoretically how the measurements are really related to the number of people and then you can do actually a lot so um, to the best of our knowledge uh, basically this is the first true wall crowd counting or crowd count even with this many number of people. So, um, and then we, did made, we basically did a lot of experiments um, in general on our campus, and so um, you can basically estimate the number of people um, um, decent enough. 100% um, of the time, error of two people and less um, with one link, and then if you throw in another link, you can do even a lot better. Go ahead. Very good question. Excellent, excellent. So actually, so um, we, we do actually have other experiments in like uh, stores. We do a lot of experiments in Costco where people are walking in aisles, the way people walk in aisles. So, so um, that's a very good question. So in these, um, in this area, people are walking um, like casually. Um, so if we have like long hallways or we're in like a aisle like Costco, so people will come from one and enter from the other or go turn around, all those can be accommodated basically. Um, but basically the way we do it is we um, take that knowledge in a sense into account in our modeling. So because I didn't get a chance to go into mathematical details, so for instance, if I'm, um, I know you're, you're going to be in an aisle, so that is information, right? So people are typically not going to just randomly move around to create income. So we take that into account of the mathematical model. Uh -huh. So you mean multiple people crossing at the same time the link. Yes, so we modeled in that. So basically, if they're up to, after four or five, five people simultaneous crosses, it doesn't make much difference, but between one people, two people, three and four, five, we take that into account in that uh, modeling. So um, the line of sight modeling, it takes into account, looks at the amount of attenuation and tries to take that into account um, in the mathematical model. Okay. Nobody moves, you mean? Excellent question. So if nobody moved at all, then I wouldn't use this. This wouldn't be suitable for it. Then I'll go back to other things. I mean, so our imaging through walls, that's more for static things, or we have done other things for angle of arrival estimation of fixed objects, or things like that, that would be more suitable. This, there needs to be 
and it's okay if people stand for a while and then move and we have like you know like a typical that they cost a while um, that's no problem but if there's zero movement then this would be fine right. uh, go ahead how fast it is um, the um, counting uh, are pretty fast actually um, a few seconds uh, I believe there is a maybe there's a parameter that he needs to find beforehand that that may take a minute or so but when you collect the data right there the processing is quite fast the imaging stuffs are a little bit uh, slower more complex with the trees but this is pretty fast you mean what we're taking advantage of for the counting? Uh, excellent question. No, actually, it does try to model both line of sight and multi path. Um, so, if you uh, don't have any line of sight um, blockage, so meaning that you have transfer receiver here, people are just walking there, it can still count the multi path component. I, I don't have the major, I, I can show you. So, it can still count for the Inter-event times, that relies on the line of sight. But for the, the other PDF I showed of this thing on magnitude, that has both components. So if you have only MP, you can take it. So, all right, so, um, so then we extended this to, um, well, what if, can we count, all, uh, can we also estimate the speed of a crowd as well, or joint crowd counting and crowd speed estimation. So let's say, uh, let's say you have like 20 people walking with a 0.3 meter per second. Um, can, can that be estimated? And so um, it turns out you can nicely extend the theories. Um, so we did a lot of experiments, we did uh, 51 experiments on our campus with up to 20 people, different speeds, indoor and outdoor, and you can estimate the, the speed normalized mean square less than um, 5% and as well as the head count or if the space is not closed the head count becomes a rival rate like number of people per second that um, come through or, or um, uh, leave the area. Um, other actually interesting thing you can do is you can show that you can not only um, if you have multiple adjacent regions where people are walking with different speeds and by the way, this speed is like an average speed, meaning that you, have to, you don't have to constantly go with that speed. Like you could, you're walking, you're standing for a bit, and so, but the average speed is what is being estimated. Now, also you have different areas. That maybe people are walking really fast here, but then you go next to they're walking slower. There. But if you have a uh, Wi-Fi link here, and maybe that the other area is not, it's also quite a, even far from here, but can this power Wi-Fi link not only estimate how fast were people walking here, but how fast were people walking next. And so you can extend actually the theories to show you can do that. And so I'm just I'm going to just mention it through an interesting result with it. So um, we put an ad and said we have some exhibitions. So we put up two exhibitions uh, in our first floor. In one exhibit we put, you know, visually not super interesting uh, uh, pictures. And in the next, uh, and then next to it, uh, next area, we put exhibitions uh, where there were images of where's Waldo. So the idea was that, okay, so where's Waldo? People are gonna be spending more time, so probably people are gonna slow down there. Whereas the first area, people are gonna walk through it faster. And so we wanted to see if we can estimate these average speeds in these two areas correctly using um, our theories. Um, and so we put an ad, we uh, said, you know, we invite you to come visit this exhibit. Uh, we didn't tell them what it was for, what the whole point was, and we just we said we were gonna get paid this much per hour. Um, so some people signed up and came, and uh, so basically in exhibit one, which was kind of not visually super interesting, the ground truth velocity was 1.1 meter per second, which is a bit faster than normal walking speed. And it was estimated at one meter per second. And exhibit two where it was where's Waldo, it was slowed down significantly to 0.12. And we the, the link estimated as at 0.3, which which basically uh, captured the, uh, the slowdown uh, nicely of the area. Uh, and um, basically 
we, as I mentioned, we did experiments also in, um, in an island, Costco. I don't have it here, but um, we chose a cookie island, Costco, so we could um, estimate correctly how people slowed down because of interest, uh, um, uh, aisle, um, um, popular aisle, basically. And other things we have done along this line that there's not much time to talk about is uh, we've also done a lot of uh, target tracking, angle of arrival estimation and localization with just Wi-Fi, but with just signal magnitude, without phase, which becomes um, quite interesting, especially if you look at angle of arrival estimation. But it turns out you can also do a lot of interesting things there. And also, turn out we um, we scared the news <laughs> quite a bit. Um, so Huffington Post said, "Government, oh, government is going to come use Wi-Fi and it's going to count you guys." Or New York Post said, "Oh, drones are going to going to come and do X-ray vision and spy on all of us." So, my students had a good time <laughs> interacting with the news. So, now in the rest of the talk, I'm going to um, basically now switch to the second. Um, in the second part, um, the goal is a little bit different. Here we're going to use communication signals for communication. But we're, look, we're going to look at a team of unmanned vehicles and how we can ensure their robust connectivity. Um, the, the difference here with the typical work in um, robotics is that we're going to take into account real communication impairments and real channel models and really what, see what's the implication of that for robotic path planning. We're going to take into account not only the motion energy but also the communication energy and there will be nice interplay between my optimum communication strategies and optimum motion strategies, as we're going to characterize. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of our work um, along these lines. So this is an area that we've been calling communication aware robotics uh, for many years now. Imagine that I have a team of unmanned vehicles. Um, that um, the, each robot have some limited sensing, communication, and processing. And they're given a task to do. For instance, they might be stand to do some search and rescue. Maybe in a crowded airport area in the future, we're going to have these unmanned vehicles move around and act as basically mobile service and information um, units, providing information and service to people, let's say, in a crowded area. Or maybe it can be useful to extend the connectivity of you know, future cellular system. So maybe I have maybe some drones help me with extending connectivity of future cellular systems. Or maybe in a home setting, um, there could be mobile routers that could move around a little bit, optimize their locations, um, at least maybe at the beginning, to have a good coverage all over the house. In my house, for instance, part of the second floor, there's, uh, there's the connectivity is not very good to where um, the router is. So maybe there could be some optimization there. So in all these problems, basically the question is uh, how to bring together the connectivity sh issues and path planning issues, and if there's also sensing, sensing issues, under resource constraint on both communication and uh, robotics. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about our, um, some of our work over the years along these lines. Um, so the first thing when we started, we got interested in this problem many years ago was the uh, idea of link prediction. So in robotic path planning, an unmanned vehicle typically needs to kind of have an, uh, some prediction of how, if it moves to a certain place, how its sensing will change or connectivity will change. And so in robotics, typically people use a disk model for predicting the connectivity. So if you're in a disk around me, we're perfectly connected, out of that there's no connectivity. So um, some of you that I've worked with in the area of communication, so uh, I had just moved many years ago from communication area to robotics, and so I was like, well, everything, everything I learned is this your disk model? That's, that can be. So, so it's not a very truthful model. This is a real channel measurement. We know this model is not going to be a very good realistic model. So then that brings the problem of how predictable is the wild channel? Because this, this model is supposed to be a prediction, very deterministic prediction. Uh, we know wild channels are not going to be very predictable. But what is the best thing, for instance, that this unmanned vehicle can say about link near this building. 
about its connectivity. So hmm, if I move there, what would happen to my connectivity? Maybe the answer is that, the best answer is that, I don't know what would happen to my connectivity because based on what I've seen so far, there's no information about what is coming up. Or maybe there is in some situations some correlation. So how can we basically equip this unmanned vehicle with its, the best prediction possible in realistic channel environments? So that was our first starting point many years ago. I'm going to briefly mention that channel prediction. So if you put together the um, underlying components that we all know in the communication literature, um, so you, you, you've, measured, you've measured received power, this unmanned vehicle. As measured is received power in a number of locations in this space. And basically you can write it as a function of the path loss, the shadowing and multi-path term. And basically shadowing, we know that um, in the DB domain, Gaussian model is a good characterization of its distribution. And we know that exponential correlation function is the, um, has been uh, shown to be a nice characterization of its spatial correlation. For multi-path, we know that there are a number of um, distributions, like let's say Nakagami distribution, that have shown to be good uh, um, fit for its um, um, ca for the um, variations of multi-path. Um, but it will, it's going to make her um, coming up with some compact form that will be used for robotic path planning more complicated. Now, there are work that have shown um, that um, if you model the Martha pattern individual with Gaussian, it's not going to be as good as Nakagami, but it's, it's actually still quite informative. So we use also um, Gaussian multi path in the DB domain um, for these characterizations. And then putting everything together, um, all these three underlying dynamics, then you can basically nicely show that if an unmanned vehicle comes and collects a couple of some sample measurements in this area, these are let's say received power measurements in transmission from a transmitter, then and then you ask yourself what is the distribution of the received power somewhere I haven't been. It turns out you can prove that a Gaussian distribution with certain mean and variance that is written here can best characterize the channel at somewhere on this. So basically, in other words, we're modeling the spatial variations of the channel at the Gaussian process. And so the nice thing about it is that, well, if Based on what this drone or unmanned vehicle has observed so far, there is information enough to say something about somewhere I haven't been. Then it's going to basically give me a Gaussian distribution with small variance. But if there's not much correlation, it's going to basically give me a very large variance. So that means basically, well, I don't really know, right? So I can capture both. So many years ago, like a decade ago, we spent a lot of time. Um, Understanding this predictability in different environments, like let's say you're in a hallway, let's say you're in a, in a, in a, in a this auditorium, let's say you're outside or inside, different setups, how, how would that predictability change? How would that underlying parameter estimation change? So we've made a lot of measurement with our unmanned vehicles over the years, and so they're all available online, um, and so they basically show the predictability and estimation of all the underlying parameters in different environments. So we did a lot of comprehensive study to just understand this, um, this. So now we have this probabilistic model. So instead of this model, we have these PDFs we can derive for the distribution of channels somewhere the robot hasn't been. So now we can take that back to any type of robotic uh, um, network robotic operation. And now we can bring together the issues of path planning, anything related to robotics part, all the things related to the communication part, and if there's any sensing component. And now we can basically derive all sorts of new theories um, in this regard. So what I'm going to just do in the next uh, um, few minutes is going to give you some samplers of some of our work along these lines over the years. Um, and uh, this is going to be a brief sampler. I'll be happy to talk to you more if you were interested. So. Let's start with this interesting problem that you have an unmanned vehicle um, that is at a point that is not connected to another node or to a remote station to something that needs to be connected. It's going to ask itself, and it's going along, uh, let's say, a path. It's going to ask itself, how much more should I travel before I get connected? Can I assess that? 
I know I'm not connected now. I've been in this environment for a bit. I have some measurements of the link um, and, and the signal strength. Can I have a prediction of how much more I should go before I get connected? And that is how you can theoretically very nicely characterize this. We call this first passage distance. So distance travel until the robot gets connected. And using those probabilistic PDF characterization of the link, we can basically nicely characterize this by modeling the field, basically the receive signal, stay, uh, the receive signal as a Gauss Markov process. We can actually prove that the transitional probability of the receive signal of uh, strength nicely satisfies uh, what's called Fokker Planck equation. And so again, I'm not going into details, but, um, but just to show you the strength of that probabilistic modeling. And then you can prove that the PDF of the first passage distance, meaning the PDF of the distance you need to travel before you get connected, would satisfy this equation, which is called second kind Volterra integral equation, which is computationally efficient, it's fast to, um, fast to um, evaluate. And you can extend it. So these were for straight line paths, and you can actually, ex uh, we've also extended to non-straight um, paths relating it to the curvature of the link and to what extent the theories will still apply. So interesting analysis you can do. By the way, the theories that we borrowed here um, are from uh, the literature of first passage time, which is used a lot in, in economy. It's basically, let's say, the time it takes for a gambler to lose all his or her money. So, um, so this has kind of similar flavor in the first passage distance, and so a um, lot of interesting theories there that we borrowed. So let's say you understand, the next question you can ask is, okay, now what if the Amavica can optimize its route? Starting from one position, what would be the best route it can take to get to a connected point as fast as possible? As fast as possible means basically uh, more mathematical terms of minimizing its motion energy consumption. So basically, so what um, we did recently is that, so this is, actually, this is actually a hard problem. So we can pose this on a graph, let's say, um, and uh, basically you have the Markov decision process. I mean, if you want to solve it, you're going to have, um, just directly solve it, the computational complexity will be really high. Um, so we're going to have an MP hard problem. Uh, what we have proved is that you can pose this, you can actually pose this as a potential game in the context of game theory. And so then um, log linear learning can asymptotically provide an epsilon suboptimal solution. So get very close to the optimal solution in this problem. So, like, like, so basically what I'm trying to motivate is that this, um, these, these probabilistic child predictions of the link opens door in robotics and pipeline for all sorts of interesting problems at that intersection that we can actually solve, like, like these sample problems. Now what if you have a number of unmanned vehicles? So um, a lot of times, depending on the task you have, maybe the unmanned vehicles have to get to certain information to have um, information, optimize the information flow over themselves. The whatever formation you need could depend on the problem of interest, what kind of network connectivity you need. So then you can basically take these um, link models and take it with co optimize with path planning to address such network configuration optimization problems. For instance, a very common one is robotic routers. Let's say you have a transmitter and a receiver that are very far from each other. And then you want to use the little mobile routers. So they move around the space and basically situate themselves as such that the information routed from transfer to receiver is optimized. In robotics, there's a lot of interest in this, but the way they solve it is they would basically not paying attention at all to the communication part uh, and communication modeling it a lot of times using this model. Here, for instance, you can basically say, well, I want to maximize the probability of correct bit reception at the end node. And this is that maximization. And basically, the key point about it is the signal to noise ratio of all the links. We're going to probabilistically model it as that Gaussian process that we derive with certain mean and variance. And that allows us to do all sorts of interesting optimization. For instance, you can even prove interesting theories. For instance, you can prove 
Under what condition on the link in the environment would that maximization problem would be a concave problem? Now this, this, this expression here what I'll go into details is basically, for instance, if the variance of your channel prediction is less than a certain amount as compared to the path loss and shadowing and so on parameters, then that problem becomes uh, concave. And then also you can prove that the worst predicted channel quality, the routers need to get closer to each other, which is intuitive, but you can now also theoretically uh, prove a lot of things. You can throw in actually the motion power and make your optimization more and more and elaborate as we've done. I'm not going to go through those details. We've done also small experiments in, um, in this part as well. For instance, here, there's a transmitter here behind these closed doors and a receiver here. And there's an unmanned vehicle starting from here, just our pioneer robot. So this, was, uh, this, this is an um, experiment we did in our lab, uh, in, our, in the building. So it basically is starting from here. Its goal is to stop at a location where it's basically routing the information from transmitter to the receiver the best possible. The best possible. So you can see that. So using our, the optimization framework we proposed, you can see that uh, basically it stops here. If I look at the, the signal strength to the transmitter, the blue signal, um, and the red one to the receiver, you can see that basically this is getting away from the receiver node, the signal strength um, comes down, the blue node goes up, and it's very interesting because uh, where it stops, the signal strength almost become similar. And we kind of seen this in other scenarios where it almost seems like the optimum configuration kind of equalizes the links. Some extent, um, it's theoretically it's not the optimum optimum thing, but could be considered in a lot of cases uh, a near optimal solution. And this this shows the bitter rate. Um, now the bitter part we simulated because we couldn't measure it off of the directly of the device. These are real. The, this is real measurement. This is the real movement. The bitter rate we simulated the end to end bitter rate, and uh, you can see that it comes. Um, just to say a couple of last pieces, and I'm gonna stop soon, um, then we can bring, bring in the elements of sensing and data collection, a more explicit optimization of um, communication parameters like transmission rates, transmission power, as well as motion parameters like the speed of the vehicle, um, as well as its robotic route, and how are these related? So co-optimization of all these strategies. For instance, let's say I have this unmanned vehicle starting at this starting point and it has to go to its destination. It has collected a lot of data, it has sensed a lot of data, and it needs to transmit it to a remote node. So as it's going to a destination, what route should it take so that it can best transmit the data but also minimizes its motion consumption? So if you want to just minimize the motion con consumption, go straight to the destination. Well, maybe that, that area may not be very good for connectivity. Now, if it deviates a lot and goes towards the remote station, well, that could be maybe good for communication, but incurs a lot of motion power. So what's the overall optimum? It depends on several factors, the link quality, the motion model, and so on. And so can we theoretically basically pose it and pose that optimization problem? And that's what we've done. So for instance, here, uh, you can basically minimize the overall communication um, transmission power and motion power, and this, this motion power is um, from um, like a DC power type unmanned vehicle. Um, and in the communication power, again, the, the term that of interest is average of 1 over P, where P is your predicted received power at different position, which we can characterize based on that probabilistic model I showed you. And then we have, um, there's a second order dynamical system model for the robot. So um, it's, it's, a, it's a hard optimization problem, but you can actually prove that. You can pose it in an optimal control framework. And uh, this is a collaboration with some of my colleagues at Georgia Tech. And so we actually were able to come up with a nice, efficient way of solving it and also proving interesting things about the optimal strategy. For instance, the optimum spectral efficiency, number of bits per second per hertz, you can prove that it is related to the predicted channel quality in this manner, where this is average of 1 over P, P being the predicted channel quality. So kind of it's intuitive, it says the higher the predicted channel quality, you expect to send a higher transmission rate. If 
And the predicted channel quality uh, is basically, so if this parameter is smaller, means the predicted channel quality is better. Then send with higher rate and also slow down. So basically the robot needs to slow down. So this gives a robot a way of um, controlling its parameters as a function of the communication link quality. And bring together the communication and motion parameters for co-optimization. Um, and so these are some test results, for instance. Um, so this is average of one over predicted channel quality. So the lower it is, that means the prediction is better. The robot starts from starting point and has to go to destination. But you can see it takes a detour in this manner where because, because basically it's also trying to take advantage of better link quality areas in addition to minimizing its motion and communication power. And you can see that basically in these areas, it's going to basically send with uh, higher um, spectral efficiency. Um, and basically, that matches basically what we have also um, predicted. The optimum matches what we've predicted. So, um, and this reduces the energy consumption significantly as compared to just going straight to the receiver, not taking into account um, the communication parameter. So, we've looked at several other scenarios, like a team of unmanned vehicles that go for tar network target track or network surveillance. So they have to survey an area, but they have to also communicate the data in between them. So a lot of cases where team of unmanned vehicles have to maintain their connectivity in order to do a task. That may involve sensing uh, as well. And so basically, you can show that you can reduce the energy considerably. You can enable new forms of connectivity, robotic routers, maybe robotic beam forming. You can prevent, that's an interesting thing, instability of estimation and control of dynamical systems. If you have an estimation control of unstable dynamical systems over wireless link, if you use a lot of packets, there's a nice theorem that shows us after some point uh, the estimation error is going to go up. Whereas in this case, you can prevent that instability because you're actively trying to find better connected areas and take that into account in every, all the optimization. Or you can reduce your end-to-end um, -end bit rate in the case of, let's say, a robotic one. So a lot of exciting opportunities, and I hope oh, um, I was able to motivate um, for you that uh, at this intersection of robotics and communication, there are a lot of exciting opportunities in this case of uh, a team of unmanned vehicles bringing together communication issues, a nice abstraction that, that takes into account realistic communication issues, and go to now robotic parameters and jointly optimize. So just to summarize, we looked at the first part of the talk how we can use everyday communication signals and enable new forms of sensing. They can tell us a lot actually about the environment and about their surrounding in terms of how many people there are, what their behavior is, who's slowing down, who's going faster, we're imaging to walk. And in the second part of the talk, we more talked about um, a robust network operation of a team of one-man vehicle bringing together uh, communication and robotic issues. So with that, I'm just going to acknowledge some of the students along the road that helped along this and the funding agencies that, has, um, that have supported um, these works over the years. Thank you very much. <laughs>